of witnesses to take their seats uh, and we'll start our set second panel. Morning. Um, and on behalf of the committee, can I thank you for coming in to give evidence today? And um, before we start with our first set of questions, perhaps I could ask you to say your name and your uh, the organisation you represent. Starting with Martin. Um, I'm Martin Todd, and I'm from the Men's Health Forum. Great. I'm Samir Jaraj, and I'm from the Race Equality Foundation. Hi, Brandon Garth. I'm a professor in psychology at Leeds Beckett University. Great, lovely. Tony, are you going to start our questions? Yes. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Evidence we've received has suggested that men and boys from BAME backgrounds experience poorer mental health than their white counterparts. Um, why is this? So, um, we would say that the evidence shows that BAME boys are more likely to experience the kind of social de detriments which you've heard about this morning. So, for example, that includes the experience of poverty, experiences of racism, um, the wider determinants of social, of, uh, the wider social determinants such as um, poor housing, um, unemployment within the family, um, and traumatic experiences. Um, and on the other side of that, they're more likely to be subject to school exclusion, um, more likely to um, to uh, to enter the mental health system via the, um, a criminal justice route and more likely to experience the more um, severe and coercive um, end of, of the mental health system. So, for example, use of the Mental Health Act, experience of restraint, experience of um, medication without consent. Thank you. Um, Brendan, got anything to add? Uh, I don't focus specifically on BME populations, but we know that, for example, in <coughs> such groups, help-seeking behaviour is more uh, limited compared to other groups of men and we know that help seeking is a key factor in men's mental health and well-being um, being worse uh, than women often. Okay. I don't have much to, to add to that. I think I think there is a, a need um, that, uh, that that any service response um, reflects not just on um, men's of ethnicity and the deprivation they face, but also their gender as well. Um, but we'll probably come on to that. Yeah, okay. Well, African and Caribbean men are more likely to enter the mental health services via the courts or the police rather than from primary care, which is the main route to treatment for most people. Um, why do you think this is? So, in addition to, to, to what, um, what we talked about mm. there, um, there's some evidence to show that, um, that there's lack of awareness of, of support that's out there. There is often very poor experiences of, um, of institutions, whether that is the school, in, um, the police, um, or um, mental health services um, themselves as well, either personally or within the broader family and community. Um, so for example, poor experiences of the mental health system um, from friends and family are likely to affect health seeking behaviours. Um, there's also um, issues around. Sorry, let me just get my notes. Um, so, because there's a delay in seeking in seeking help, then people are more likely to develop more severe end um, symptoms and conditions that will then require more um, cursive intervention. So, for example, use of the Mental Health Act. And then once within the mental health system, um, experience qu quite severe um, racialised response in terms of use of those coercive methods. And there's been a number of, of cases that have been in, in the public over a number of decades of, of um, African-Caribbean men where that has been the case, um, from Orville Blackwood through to um, Ola Sandy um, Lewis more, most recent, more recently. Okay. Um. Do I have anything to add to that? I think that also um, black men are also more likely to um, receive medication as a response to their issues rather than talking treatments such as psychotherapy, which is what, is... what effect do you think entering the mental health services in this way has on both the treatment and the outcome? 
it's an extremely traumatic way to um, to enter the mental health system. Um, so, for example, I've interviewed a number of, of people who, um, a number of um, African Caribbean men who've entered the system through this way, and um, it, it, it's, it's a trauma in, in of itself. Um, and then the experience of medication can be can be um, devastating. So, for example, one, one person I, I interviewed had been a, a musician for much of his life and had developed um, a, a, um, schizophrenia and was given regular injections of quite high-end antipsychotics. So for most of the week, he said he was just too tired to do, to do anything. And it wasn't really a living existence in that, in that way. He, there, was, there was no way... He, he had no creative um, energy to, to, to do what he, what he loved in his vocation. And so this often led to him... Um, um, it, like clearly, it's usually kind of turned being non-compliant. So he he would get, go off his medication because being on his medication was was um, so awful, and then that would lead to a extreme kind of relapse, and then be sectioned again by the police, and that would re-enter the mental, um, the system that way. Within criminal justice, we know that black men are more likely to be um, have adjudications brought against them within the prison system. Um, we know that. Um, one of the reasons why black men fear um, seeking help and, and, and access early on is the fear of possible consequences, and that includes loss of status, control, independence and autonomy, and within the criminal justice system that is all taken away from you. Um, and then on top of that, all you're left with a criminal record, mm -hmm. and all that entails um, for your life chances. And you have to deal with the potential consequences of what offence you have um, done in order to get there in the first place. And that, again, kind of compounds and really kind of has a detrimental impact on uh, the ability to recover. So, Samir, what can the government and public bodies do to increase the chances of African and Caribbean men engaging with mental health services via primary care rather than the courts and the police? So, it... In our kind of in our experience, um, the it is it is that kind of issue of, of trust, which which again we've kind of talked about in terms of of childhood and, and adolescent mental health as well. So it is about building um, on relationships of trust, whether those whether that can happen within um, at an early age within kind of the schooling system. But I think um, and in our experience in the, the more adult setting, that's about strengthening um, community organisations and community-based um, mental health services. So, for example, you're you're not um, deeply anxious or, or worried about um, about seeking help and services because you know and trust that service because it um, serves your community because it's rooted within your community. And there are there are a number of of examples which I can which I can send through of. of or, um, of services that try and and do that. Um, you know, the greatest fear for, for someone accessing, you know, for, for, for anyone kind of really, um, but in particular, um, black men accessing any form of mental health service is that you will end up <coughs> sectioned, medicated, in a cell, mm -hmm. and your life at risk. Can I just ask, yeah. a, though we're obviously interested here, particularly at differentiating between the responses of young men and young women mm -hmm. and what you've talked about there in terms of help seeking behavior and the importance of building a trust relationship presumably that is exactly the same for men and women or not um so the experience of, of so what, what in what way is the situation different for women and men for black men and black women so black men um for many decades have had quite a a racialized perception of their of of their behaviour, and again, we heard earlier about how boys externalise their um, their mental health issues. So, if I can give the the example of 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 Orville Blackwood, and this is a case from the the end of the eighties, but it's still something which which we go back to, and it was an example of of a, a person I think if I remember had both a learning disability and a mental severe mental health condition. And when 
he was uh, restrained and in, um, injected with, uh, with what it was a fatal, a fatal dose of, um, of sedatives. The public inquiry um, into it concluded that the response of clinicians was based upon this stereotyped view that this man was, and the, the actual the subtitle to the report was big, black, and dangerous. That <coughs> the that the response that a large black man um, receives from the police or from uh, mental services is consciously or unconsciously different, um, and that's again kind of been borne out through through a number of um, through a number of specific incidents and pieces of work. So you're, you're talking there, because we've talked so far about the the stereotyped, gender stereotyping in terms of men and boys themselves, mm. but you're talking about a stereotyped response to men and boys yes. as being as part of that. Now, would that <coughs> stereotyped response be any different between men and women? Um, black men and women. The evidence would seem to would seem to suggest that. So your so the stereotyping is working in both directions and differently for dependent on whether you're a man or a woman. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, I mean, there are instances of there, there are instances in, in areas where um, there are very clear mental health issues affecting a um, um, a specific group of women within a. Um, within a black and minority ethnic community, so for example, um, South Asian yeah. women tend to have higher rates of self harm, um, and and again, there's, there's, as we've heard here, that there's again there's something around kind of internalisation of um, of of trauma and of and expression of of mental ill health through that. But presumably, that internalisation and externalisation yeah. is actually down to gender stereotyping as well from mm. the very early age. Because I presume there's no chromosomal reason why that would happen. No, no it's, it's a social socialization process, yeah. um, and there's lots of evidence um, from early on that boys and girls are taught to deal with emotions differently. Um, and in the case of boys and men, it's often in very maladaptive, problematic ways, externalizing ways that we've heard about already. So it's a uh, parenting game. We were talking about that earlier. Stephanie, oh, sorry, it's Martin. That we don't just treat, you know, for example, help seeking as a kind of internalised thing. Why aren't men looking for help? You know, one of the classics we hear is men don't go to the doctor as much as women do. Well, they do as soon as they retire. There's no difference at all between retired men and women in terms of how much they go to the doctor. No. So they're just busier than women are. Well, they prioritise because because identity is so tied up in work. They prioritise work ahead of their mental health and their physical health. And there are also greater consequences, for example, in terms of um, the, the income hit of having a diagnosed mental health problem in the workplace for men is dramatically bigger than it is for women. Um, so one of the things that's quite important when we talk about stigma is it's real. It has real consequences in terms of employment, in terms of income, in terms of promotability, in terms of who gets made redundant first. All of these kind of factors need to be taken into account. So sometimes the reason that men don't ask for help is actually a, is a fairly rational response to the world they see around them and the expectations that other people have of them and the reactions that they think other people may take towards them. Mm -hmm. Stephanie. Thank you, Chair. And the evidence we've received suggests that gay, bisexual and transgender men have poor mental health. Of what accounts for this? Uh, okay, so we know that lots of different minority groups um, who, are, who experience marginalisation um, have more difficulty coming forward to mainstream services because they don't see themselves represented in mainstream services, they don't trust mainstream services um, and they don't have access to the masculinity capital that will make them more confident about coming forward. Um, they are kind of subordinated within the masculinity spectrum and they don't feel uh, able to trust services or other men with their uh, vulnerability. 
I mean, um, something that, that I'd add as well, just in terms of the race perspective, is that um, there's very poor amounts of evidence on the experience of black minority ethnic LGBTQ people. Um, where it does exist, it, tend, it tends to show that, that these are compounding um, these are compounding factors in terms of poor mental health. Um, there's virtually nothing on the experience of black minority ethnic trans people um, whatsoever, and, and that's that's a real kind of um, gap in terms of, of of our understanding, and in particular our response to to need. Following on from, from your answers, some of our evidence has suggested that mental health service is not inclusive of minority groups. Do you agree with this? And if so, why? I would, I would agree. Um, so I, uh, um, I would say that generally mental, uh, mental health services, like most health services, are commissioned at a population level. Um, so it's about generally about numbers. It's generally about numbers within a specific area as well. So there's much less kind of, of understanding and, and specific commissioning it um, in terms of understanding and meeting the needs of minority communities um, there are pervasive attitudes within the um, the front line that by kind of v virtue of assertion that they that they don't discriminate so the, you know, the attitude being that because I, I don't consciously because I don't consciously um, experience direct prejudice towards someone, um, that therefore that, um, that there is nothing going on there, or one of the lines you often hear is that you know anyone can walk in the door. It it, it can take a lot for for someone to expose their vulnerability, whether whether they're um, an African Caribbean man, whether they're a, um, an LGBT person who is deeply concerned about coming out to a medical professional um, and what that might mean for their. For their health, for their safety, for their kind of state of mind. Yes, it, just, it's just, just specifically on. Uh, I, I know we're talking about minorities within mm. this already marginalised group who aren't coming forward, but when you're talking about commissioning mm. uh, and going back to Maria's point about the difference between men and women in this instance, do you think that mental health services are commissioned well for women in this instance? Not Any sure. of you? Because to me, it's an incredibly masculine environment that is entirely commissioned. For example, you would never get... Either, I think there are two places in the country where you can get specialist women's substance misuse services. Um, it just doesn't exist. Um, so I just wonder if you think that there is a specific commissioning issue full stop about the services. Well, I, th I think, I mean, there's some exciting, there's interesting work going on in places like Leeds where they've just done a whole review of men's health and a whole review of women's health yeah. and are looking at how they can tailor services to meet, meet the needs of men better and meet the needs of women better. And, and we've always argued for a national men's health policy. There may be a case for a national gender health policy. Um, and I do, um, I do think that where... Um, people are a minority within a particular problem, you're likely to face issues. So drug and alcohol services, you know, are generally tailored more effectively towards men because men are the majority of people using them. I mean, there are huge issues to do with dual diagnosis and other such things, but you will get the issue that inevitably in those circumstances mm -hmm. um, that uh, women may be underserved. I mean, I think sometimes in the question of, of mental health generally, I think there is an issue that I don't know. At the moment, it feels a bit like some of the discussion we have around heart disease, where we're going, we're not doing a proper job of diagnosing women and offering them the support they need because the majority of people with heart disease are men. Which is not and true. It's, the, well, majority the majority of people, of people with who heart die, disease are not men. Three quarters of the people who die prematurely under the age of 75 or 65 are men. Um, but, but, and with mental health, it almost feels like the reverse situation where uh, uh, there, are, there is a, a, quite a lot of academic case being made that the way we diagnose um, uh, d um, depression and anxiety, um, the indicators that we look at to include are gendered and so we're actually underestimating um, the level of male distress that there is within society and the, and the, and the people who might benefit from support. So I was just, I, 
<laughs> OK, um, we've had limited evidence on the impact of having a disability on men and boys' mental health. Do you have any experience of this subject really, in your work? Um, well, I, think I mean, uh, like, like Martin, I work in this field, but for, and I've done a big literature review recently, and I haven't found anything where disabled men are represented. So it's clearly a gap in the literature. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is an under-resourced area. I mean, there are quite a few areas where men are more likely to have a disability. Um, autism, learning difficulties, hearing problems. I mean, one whole area where there are clear mental health consequences is amputation. Men are three quarters of amputations, either, either through industrial accident or through diabetes. One area where there has been some work in terms of the consequences of disability uh, is probably with military veterans um, who face mental, some, a minority face um, mental and physical disability. Uh, and there is obviously a clear link between um, disability and, and um, poor mental health. But in terms of somebody actually joining the dots in, in, in a way that we've just talked about for BAME, um, men's mental health, there really isn't very much out there. And, and one of the things that we keep running into in, in the equalities world generally is um, the greater need for disaggregation of data to be looking more intersectionally but more deeply at inequalities to, to understand what's going on. And we, we sometimes say that gender is the canary in the coal mine. You know, if nobody, if people aren't even looking at gender, and that quite often happens, then frankly they're not looking at anything at that point. Um, something which has uh, come to mind is that um, when the CQC did their review of deaths in the NHS estate, one of the um, areas that was flagged in terms of, of pe people that were at the highest risk of dying within the NHS estate um, were people with a mental health condition and a physical health condition and or disability um, and or people with a learning disability and mental health condition um, as well. So. It, there, are, there was some evidence around that. In, in terms of our work, we, um, we've done some, some work on the, on the experience of um, Asian women with a disability, um, which I can um, send on, um, but nothing specifically on the experience of men with a, um, with a um, disability. And a final question <coughs> for Professor Gough. In your evidence, you say that gender ideals and practices are changing. What did you mean by this, and how will it affect um, mental health of men and boys. Well, I'll start with a disclaimer. Um, traditional uh, expectations around men and masculinity are still influential, but there's some emerging evidence, especially with boys and younger men, that they're not so hung up on some of those traditional ideals and that they're becoming more inclusive and more caring uh, to themselves and in their relationships. Uh, they're less homophobic, they have more female and gay friends, for example. Um, the evidence is a bit mixed at the minute, but there are some indications that for younger groups, they're kind of moving in that more positive direction. Um, but as I say, these more contemporary moves coexist with prevailing traditional expectations and pressures, which of course are related to some of the mental health issues that we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's really interesting to listen to the discussion this morning and what's come out for me, more than anything else, is the very corrosive effect of gender stereotyping, um, um, not just amongst children, but amongst those who are delivering services. So I think that's really interesting. But when you start to think about how you can then deliver, particularly mental health services, um, it, is it that, you know, given the world as it is, not as we'd like it to be, is it that you're saying to us that we have to have far more specialised provision? Or are you saying that the provision that we have has to be able to deal with uh, far more specific needs? What, well, what, I think we have to look to at the evidence of best mm. practice and what works, not mm. just in the UK, but across the world. Mm. And the emerging evidence is that for many groups of men and boys, that community-based interventions uh, are much more preferable. Um, and the evidence on effectiveness is not quite there yet, but there are some uh, case examples where uh, community initiatives show a lot of promise. So, so give me an example of what a community-based initiative is. Well, 
An obvious one, it might have been mentioned before, um, is the Men Sheds movement for older men. So men who are retired or isolated, uh, at risk of mental health problems, uh, they go to a shed, which generally isn't a shed, it's a community venue, and they meet other men who make stuff together, it could be carpentry or something, and in that process of you know, socialising with other men, doing stuff together, having a chat during the tea break, or maybe even going to the pub afterwards, you see mental health benefits. So it's not, a, it's not badged as a mental health initiative, and that's important. Um, it's a community initiative, and we know that older men really benefit from this type of intervention. So your answer to my question would be, you really need to go specific. Well, that's w what works. That's what we're seeing from the evidence. I mean, I think there needs to be a range of options, but if, if I had to choose from a limited range, I would go in that direction. Okay. Martin? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I mean, the start point is that general access services have to work for men as well as they do for women, and they have to work for black men, and they have to work for LGBT men. So I think there's, you know, there is an awful lot that needs to be done to make sure that the front line, when people do actually come to the point of accessing services, um, works for, for all. Um, I think we need to be open that there are interventions that appear to work as well for men uh, as they do for women. So IAPT, for example, the evidence seems to be that it works as well for men as it does for women. The issue there is that far fewer men um, are accessing it. Um, so, yeah, so I, 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 and, then, and then there is a lot of evidence as well that particularly getting upstream and dealing with these problems earlier, that community interventions, peer support, um, often delivered through the voluntary community sector are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and particularly for, for dealing with very marginalised groups, you know, for, I don't know, gypsy and traveller men, for example, then you need to be working with the community in order to be delivering um, services that work effectively and engage with, um, with those groups. Right. Samir? Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the side of both. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in that... Um, you know, from my perspective, um, I, I want uh, an African-Caribbean man who's in a, a predominantly um, white British area to, to be able to go, to go to a mental health service or enter a mental health, health service and be as safe and cared for as um, someone in, in a, who, who can access a, um, a lovely, nice community setting and and it's one of the things that that you know kind of representing um black and white ethnic people that that you're very aware of in that there is though there is that disparity of of where of what type of services are available and where which is why mm -hmm. mainstream services need to be um you know, need to be improved even if it's even if pe people are quickly rooted through to something specialist that's you know it, it needs to be as safe and effective as as possible um, but, and a lot of that is going to be about the training of people who are not just delivering the service but are the gatekeepers to the service so gps um, indeed and but you know i think as well because one of the the, the yeah, points that i that raised at the start was was about kind of you know about the wider determinants of um of health as well so uh, Actually, kind of, is is this something that is about who has who has those relationships of trust in the um, you know with with people in the yeah. in the community, whether, whether that's through um, teachers, whether that's through friendships and uh, and and, you know, and and other relationships that might not that 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 could and should could and should be there. Um, you know, in terms of. No, I was going to say, because of the stigma issue, I mean, we did some work with a, a, an online chat service that men could access to talk about their mental health, and part of that came from the fact that because of stigma, because of men's concerns about, um, uh, because of, of discrimination, part of the mix probably needs to be access to anonymous and confidential services as well, because people are very worried about the impact on their reputation you know what happens if their employer knows what happens if their community knows what happens to their what happens to their family knows they're not always happy to do that so there need to be ways in where people feel like nobody will ever know and that partly also involves you know when the services are available because obviously if you can only access them during working hours it's pretty obvious that something's going on so you know they need to be available out of hours they need to be 
available you know when whenever suits men um, so I think there is there is a need to think about the pressures particularly and the desire for that, that nobody knows in some cases because of the concern about discrimination to make sure the right mix of services is available and so there is also a very key role like in terms of of what works we know that that traumas and the experience of of poverty for example are a key factor in developing a, um, a mental health condition and that actually there are well-established social policies to to reduce those those risks. We we can we can talk about improving mental health services, um, but actually, kind of there is a key role and a, a really kind of quite important role in reducing disparities through through prevention. And whether that's you know kind of um, looking very specifically at school exclusion, the experience of school exclusion, which you know um, has a, has a disproportionate impact on. Um, Caribbean boys, um, if it's looking at um, the experience of the type of housing you grew up in, if you grew up in overcrowded housing, you're more likely to experience an anxiety disorder. Black minority ethnic children are more likely to grow up within an overcrowded home. If you grow up within a cold home, you're more likely to experience a depressive disorder. Black minority ethnic children are more likely to grow up within a cold home. So I think we, we can be more ambitious than um, than you know, looking at what can be done with mental health services and actually kind of what can be done with um, with public services because in our experience you know when when someone ends up in in like a secure mental health unit which is you know, kind of really kind of high end the most expensive and often the least effective um, form of treatment it's because they've been failed multiple times by other institutions within our society they've washed around criminal justice, they've washed around other tiers of mental health and they've ended up there and, and preventing that from, from happening um, you know, would, would be a really key and important thing, to, I think, to, achieve, to, to want to achieve. Um, I think, actually, you've already answered this question um, uh, in your last answer, but so I will put it to uh, Martin and... Uh, Professor Goff, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hate it when people use any title that I have. Um, what is the economic? Uh, what is the impact of economic insecurity on men and boys' mental health? Uh, it's absolutely enormous. I mean, you know, the difference between, the, for example, if you take the suicide rate, the difference between the richest areas and the poorest areas in the country is about ten to one. Okay. Um, That's and sometimes I sometimes to, to, to try and you know extend the debate. I sometimes make the point to say that um, we talk about a lot about the fact that you know a man is three times more likely to die from suicide than women. Um, but we also need to be honest about the fact that with me as a professional manager, um, an unskilled labourer is three times more likely to die from suicide as I am. Is there, a, is there an axis of that where, so I don't wish to use you as the example of somebody dying, but uh, where a poor woman is more likely than a rich man? A poor, uh, it's, I think it's about the same. About the same. I think, okay. I, think, right. I think it's about the same. I'm not entirely sure. I, haven't, um, I would need to check that. Um, uh, and there's an interesting point, again, we sometimes make, uh, that men are more unequal than women. So we have all the billionaires, um, but we also have... The majority of people sleeping rough, the majority of people in prison. We have a bigger life expectancy gap than women do between mm -hmm. men and women. There's like it's a couple of years difference between the top 10% and the bottom 10%. Um, it's bigger for men than it is for women. Um, and, and one of the reasons we often argue for a men's health policy in general mm -hmm. is that those men who are facing the biggest risk of mental health issues are going to be the men that then go on and face the biggest risk of heart disease, the biggest risk of cancer, the biggest risk of dying prematurely generally. But can I just ask that on those that, that you've made a painted a very vivid picture of huge divergence um, within groups of men. But what is driving that huge divergence? Is it discrimination or is it a, well find it difficult to understand that it would be discrimination that would be driving that huge divergence. What, what, what in why, terms of health outcomes? Uh, it would just in terms of, you've just painted a very vivid picture of 
more of an men. unequalness that uh, exists yes. between men that doesn't exist between women. The, the trouble is, is that women don't get to the in the in yeah, the part well, of the fact is that women don't get, women to, the don't top. get to be billionaires yeah. and don't get to be yeah. you know FTSE low. 100 directors and chief executives and all of those kind of things. So it is partly that men are populating. Um, the very top end of income but it's important to remember and one of the reasons is that most men aren't you know most men aren't populating the very high end of income Um, and there are some particular factors that relate to men's health and particularly in terms of health behaviors uh, smoking smoking less of a gap than used to be but um, drinking for example some of those inequalities will also be driven by that sorry that the health inequalities will be driven by the other inequalities which are driven by I suppose one would say privilege, you know, yeah. so the pressure and the heart disease and... Yes, although, again, you know, there is, the, there is the perspective of, you know, there's the perception that it's the, you know, the stressed executive who's most likely to keel over from, from heart disease and it's not, you know, it's actually the guy who's, you know, it's, um, it, it, it's people in unskilled jobs who are most likely to be at risk, possibly because of the link to smoking. The well, reason why I sort of wanted to dwell on that a little bit is that sometimes we find it very difficult to unpick the difference between discrimination and just difference. Um, and, you know, are people suffering discrimination? And obviously we are really focused on the way discrimination law works um, or doesn't work uh, for various groups of people. So uh, unpicking sometimes the, the big divergence that you've been talking about very, very well is, is not necessarily down to discrimination, just down to... Uh, no, I mean, I think there is, a, there is a case, you know, certainly it, it would appear to be the case that one of the reasons that BME people, you know, might have worse health is they're also earning less as well. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there, aren't, there are far fewer BME billionaires in FTSE 100, <laughs> you know, chief executives and board members or... Mm-hmm you know, hospital trust chief executives or whatever whatever area you might want to look the, the at. The issue of smoking, though, is an, an interesting one where you pick up the, the you know, so they are, uh, do more men smoke? Um, men? Historically, it was much, much higher difference. Yeah. Is that just a stereotype thing again? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. It's a very All interesting really area because it varies smoke. also by ethnicity. So there are some ethnic groups where there are very big differences in smoking. Uh, amongst the white no, population, is it is now fairly comparable. There is a difference in profile of what people smoke. So men are more likely to smoke roll-ups, and women are more likely to smoke cigarettes. Um, I mean, it could be but um, but uh, but the, the huge gap that used to exist between men and women it is slightly opening up again. So it had almost disappeared a few years ago, where there was almost no gap at all. Uh, and it, I'm not. I don't think anybody's entirely clear why it might be something to do with the uptake of vaping and various other things. But there seems to be a a gap reopening between men and women but in the grand scheme of things it's still quite small and again the gap between uh, areas of deprivation and you know the class-based gap in smoking is far bigger now than the gender gap um, and so uh, I mean go back to the idea of the economic impact you've painted a very you know just the, the the suicide rates even alone are stark between the top uh, and the bottom so yeah, just to friend of, that, um, there's clear evidence that linking austerity with the rising suicide rate among men, not just in this country, but in various European countries as well. Um, And that's clearly tied to uh, meaningful work being connected to, very deeply, to men's identities. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, the sort of point on that, unemployment in particular is pretty devastating for men's health. Um, And it was striking... There was an analysis done in 2014 looking at the consequences of the 2008 um, economic crisis and we normally talk um, about a sort of four to one ratio, a three to one ratio in terms of male suicide. The estimate of extra suicide as a result of the recession was 800 extra male deaths and 155 female deaths, so even more extreme. And that's probably in part down to the sort of gender role of being the provider and you know, having a job and defi- and men defining themselves by their job. Ultimately, how, it's how one can of the we reasons. Stop that? How can, well, as a policymakers, how can um, we stop that? I, personally, I I've think. Stopped it in my house. Yeah, I mean, personally, I think. Uh, I mean, we are on to much wider discussions as mm-hmm. to how we create gender equality. I think part of it needs to be changing the norm of what being at the top of an organisation looks like, what success looks like. So it's not just always on 24-7, working completely hard, no caring responsibilities, never Mm -hmm. taking time off for mental health, for physical health, for anything else. 
And so part of the agenda, I think, needs to be not just removing the barriers for women to get to the top of organisations, which is vital and absolutely important, but in the end, if we just create a model that says women who are always on and work 24-7 have no caring responsibilities and you know, can get to the top, we haven't really solved anything. So to me, I think it's part of an agenda of taking a more ambitious approach towards creating a norm that men are carers, that they have time off to care, that they take paternity leave, and we should be doing this both on a government level and we should be saying to enlightened employers to be kind of the vanguard of this, to say, we need you to make this work. We need you to be setting models that go far beyond the statutory minimum um, because I think it's only when we actually start to expand what male success looks like and allow it not just to be rich and successful in your job, you know, to take and, and a successful provider, it's only when we expand the definition of male success um, to, to open up areas, caring in particular, because you know, that leads to so much inequality, that we will get to a point that, that some of these other factors may start to... I mean, that might be hopelessly optimistic. No, but, you know, that's let's be a, hopelessly optimistic. But, you know, I'll, yeah, I'm all for something it. I happen to believe. Um, well, yeah, sorry. Just a, qu a quick point yeah. on, on Ross Deeping. There, there would be a, a clear policy um, issue around how priority need works in terms of, of, of why men and men are more likely to end up yes. um, Ross Leaping. Do you know what? That was exactly what was in my mind uh, when, when yeah. Martin was talking. I was thinking about Ross Leaping. You're no. right. Policy, that's the policy driver which leaves men more vulnerable. So. Although, yeah. interestingly, I did, I did some work on, on Ross Leaping in... Uh, in Northampton, out, outside of this, outside of this job, which I'm in, in, here in that capacity, but one of the issues that came up there was that um, couples on this on, who were on the street together um, were being required to kind of uh, to to separate and right, go into yeah, different yeah, yeah. different types of, of so men into a night shelter, women into temporary accommodation, um, yeah. which then meant they, that no one them wanted to take that up. What you've done today, really vividly, is underline the importance of us uh, looking at the issue of stereotyping um, in, in our report, and hugely important that we have some very concrete sort of uh, analysis of that and some of the recommendations that we make about that, because what you've, what you've talked about is going to be good for everybody, yeah. so the more that we can give, uh, remove those stereotypes which create